Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mumbles podcast. My name is Sim. Along with me is my co-host Hossam Gamea. And I'm sorry. I was just saying salam to everybody. Oh, <laughs> um, I thought you said I, I pronounced your name wrong again because you you last time I think we uh, had you on I was pronouncing your name incorrectly or something. Uh, <laughs> We have a very special guest for you guys today. We have a former Al Jazeera journalist and currently working on a new documentary regarding uh, BDS and the various uh, efforts that are being done uh, towards BDS. And I hope we can talk to him a little bit about that. His name is Ali Al Arian. He is uh, uh, probably more well known for his father, who has uh, a, a bit of a, a, a rocky story, a, a really sad story in many respects. Um, and, uh, Ali, uh, you are also the brother-in-law of Dr. Jonathan Brown as well, right? As I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, well, let's start things off and, and let's, let's talk about um, how your, your father came to this country and uh, what, what his um, early <clears throat> life was, and then you can kind of open that up towards your life and, and um, how everything kind of transpired the way it did. <clears throat> sure. Um, my father came to this country in 1975. Um, he was a, born in exile in Kuwait. His parents were Palestinian from the coastal city of Yaffa, um, known as Jaffa in English. And um, <clears throat> he, his family was kicked out of Kuwait um, just a few years after he was born, um, pretty much due to the fact that his father refused to cooperate with the Kuwaiti government uh, and intelligence services and spying on uh, Palestinians living in Kuwait. And they relocated to Egypt, where um, he grew up until he was 17 and came to the U.S. for college. The reason he came to the U.S. for college is because um, when he was growing up in Egypt, he actually really wanted to practice medicine. But um, after Sadat came to power, uh, there was eventually a time when uh, Sadat passed a law basically limiting um, the number of Palestinians in Egypt that could practice medicine. He ended up actually applying to an engineering program here in the US. He came here in 75 um, and worked all the way up through his PhD and decided to basically settle here and um, eventually found a job teaching at a university in Tampa, Florida, the University of South Florida, uh, where I was born. Um, he was very active um, within the Muslim community early on from the moment he basically arrived um, here in the States. Um, as a teenager, he would spend uh, as a teenager and a college student he would spend his weekends you know going to local prisons and um, basically teaching Islam and working with prisoners there um, he was involved in lots of the um, institutions that we now know as far as the conversations and, and, and lots of the work that was put into establishing these institutions and um, of course he became a lot more known nationally um, during the late 90s when um, 28 people um, across the U.S., Arabs and Muslims were being held um, in prison under what was known then as secret evidence. Um, this was basically evidence that no one was allowed to see that was holding these people behind bars, including my uncle and my father's brother-in-law, who was uh, held in prison for over three years under secret evidence. So this was during the Clinton years. Um, my father started a national campaign, founded an organization, built lots of um, uh, Ali, can I put relations. you on pause for a second and just help a lot of the, the younger listeners? They don't know <clears throat> what everyone thinks evidence has to be shown in court. How does what's this term of secret evidence uh, that? Yeah, secret evidence basically is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's evidence that um, the government argued that for national security reasons, they um, couldn't actually reveal what this evidence was, but that they definitely do have evidence implicating you in um, something, whether it's related to national security or immigration or, or anything like that. And who gets to see that? Nobody. The, uh, defense, yeah, doesn't either? the defense doesn't get to see it either? Or? The defense does not get to see it. No. Not even the judge behind closed doors? Nothing. Wow. Um, so it was, um, I mean, you know, pretty 
uh, blatantly unconstitutional. Yeah. And um, my father started building a lot of relationships with other groups that started to agree with this, including um, you know dozens of non-Muslim groups as well who were outraged about this, even though it was pretty much just used to target Arabs and Muslims. Um, and it was a pretty uh, vibrant campaign. It resulted in uh, Newsweek in 2001 uh, naming my father as the premier civil rights activist in the country. And um, it basically involved a lot of lobbying in Washington. I mean, he was going there basically every other week meeting with congressmen and women, um, as well as people from even the Justice Department who um, eventually pledged to stop using secret evidence um, after a pretty vibrant campaign involving a lot of these groups. But eventually, um, of course, his goal transitioned to also um, you know, free the people that were all, that were still in prison under this. So this was during the Clinton years. So of course, um, you know, a lot of people, especially my age, who for them, you know, 9-11 marked a considerable shift, which no doubt, of course it was. Um, and, um, you know, George W. Bush kind of helped usher in this era of neocons. Um, for, for a lot of these people, you know, it's the Republican Party that's the party of Islamophobia, that's the party of, um, you know, cracking down on, on, on Muslim American activism and so on. But, you know, our experience is that this existed well before, um, you know, George W. Bush. It existed during the Clinton years. It existed when, um, you know, in 1995, I think they started, they declared um, a lot of Palestinian groups as terrorist organizations and started already targeting people for material support. So, um, and, and the FBI, of course, you know, only increased um, their surveillance operations and their so-called counterterrorism operations after 9-11 because, you know, they, they had the ability to do that given the climate that existed in this country. But this is something that, you know, you can trace back before this. And it's important that we do because otherwise we lose a lot of the context when we just restrict it to one political party or, or one time period as if 9-11 was year zero for many people in this country. But no doubt the fact that my father was able to actually be meeting with some of these top representatives in Congress um, to get bills on the floor and so on was um, a, a considerable achievement and one that's much harder to do now, of course, after 9-11. Uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, one thing that was, you know, really admirable about your dad um, and I think is really missing from the Muslim community, especially people who try to <clears throat> constantly justify their engagement with the political system is how much of a strategist he was, right? Like how planned out all of his all of his actions and commitments towards lobbying, et cetera, were. It wasn't like he was going there for photo ops. He, was, he wasn't going there for, you know, to... Um, uh, you know, get opportunities for himself or anything like that. It was very calculated. Like if he supported somebody in some capacity, it was for a specific, very, very specific reason. And he wasn't doing so in a way that was necessarily compromising any other principles. Um, like, you know, for me, like one thing that's really um, telling about your father is that, um, you know, they saw him as a threat because of his strategic mind, right? Because of his ability to basically finesse the system. Um, and, you know, that's something the Muslim community has not really gotten back um, or doesn't really have at the moment at all, especially since your father left. As you mentioned, he started many of the, you know, big organizations, many of us, or he was central to the beginning of many of those big organizations that we know of uh, today in the Muslim community that, you know, uh, to do a lot of work for us. So, you know, like, would you say that... Um, when the U.S. government began, uh, especially targeting him, uh, you know, you m mentioned before 9-11, but it was especially after 9-11, right, if I'm not mistaken, where they really took advantage of that to basically get rid of your father from the U.S. Would you say that a lot of that is because of his ability to manipulate or not manipulate, but like maneuver in the system through legal means yeah. um, to get what the most good, you know, things for Muslims or, or just people in general? Yeah, I mean, um, I obviously, um, you know, have a lot to admire for uh, regarding my father's legacy. He wasn't the only person who, um, you know, was was um, incredibly strategic in terms of how he approached lobbying for Muslim Americans' interests and, of course, the interests of many other minority groups in this country. Um, I think of people like Agha Saeed, um, based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, who was also very uncompromising in terms of um, his commitment to um, our moral principles and the issues that matter to us. 
Um, and uh, of course, you know, um, I think Glenn Greenwald, when he revealed um, the names of several of Muslim American leaders who uh, were targeted during the NSA um, spying uh, during the Edward Snowden leaks, Agha Said was named as one of the people who was, you know, consistently watched um, by the government. But I think of people also who are even deliberately targeted, like the Holy Land Foundation and others, um, who were obviously targeted because of the effect and the impact that they had on this community. And there was a, a clear, deliberate effort on the part of the government to make an example out of these people. And it worked. I mean, we can't, you know, lie to ourselves as a community that it didn't work, that it didn't actually instill a great amount of fear in this uh, community. And it didn't actually um, result in what we see now. I mean, I think one of the things that you were trying to, um, you know, uh, get at in, in, in what you just said is, as far as being strategic was was the fact that you know that story the story of the campaign for secret evidence is actually um a story for me about how you can actually engage with the system in this country without having to compromise on any of your principles or any of your positions and i think something that we're regularly seeing now among you know many of our leaders and the institutions that we have is basically the idea that in order to get something done you have to give up a lot in return so you have to normalize with um, Islamophobic and Zionist organizations that have actually spent, you know, several, several years demonizing our community, um, working with police officers and FBI agents and TSA agents who profile us as a community and so on. And this is because this is the way that we get ahead. This is the way that we advance our interests. What these interests are and what these policy positions are, we don't really know because even policy positions that are, you know, seen as um, very, you know, quote unquote, easy to kind of push forward things like, um, you know, challenging the Muslim ban and so on. Um, even that, I can't say that as a community, we've really taken the charge or the lead on that. I mean, you know, a lot of white liberals in this country, frankly, did. And had they not actually stood up against the Muslim ban, I'd be very curious to see what the Muslim community actually would have done. So I think that, you know, <clears throat> um, We've, we've reached a situation where due to the targeting of several people um, and due to the kind of climate of fear that was instilled. I mean, the FBI, after arresting my father in 2003, they visited many people's uh, homes in the community um, just for the sole purpose of just scaring them, of just instilling fear in them. And so on some level, you can understand why they would be terrified, of course. Uh, a pillar of the community, someone who founded the mosque and, and the local Islamic school and, and was kind of leading national, you know, campaigns for uh, Muslims' rights, you know, and was basically your neighbors hauled off to prison, held in solitary confinement, some of the worst conditions before a trial even occurs, will naturally lead people to be terrified. But unfortunately, I haven't seen that a reasonable amount of people have kind of stood up and um, tried to recapture the attitude of many, you know, Muslim American leaders and institutions um, who kind of push forward our, in our interests in uncompromising ways before 9-11. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because, you know, when we watched the documentary USA versus al um, you know, many of the people who were advocating for your father were not even particularly Muslim, right? Um, and I know I've spoken to you, you know, on a personal level several times about this, about um, how kind of the Muslim community, we talk about this this idea of ummah, but there isn't, there doesn't seem to be much follow up when it comes to our leadership, our, our people being attacked on a, in a way that would lead to like, you know, being courageous where, you know, the FBI is scaring you, but, you know, part of, you know, fighting or resisting against, you know, oppression, you have to kind of get over that hump, get over that fear. It doesn't seem like Muslims as a community are willing to go over that, that hump. I mean, like, so like when I talk to people about political prisoners and stuff like that, it's just like a thing that, you know, if they feel distant towards, they don't feel connection towards it. You know, I feel like for you, a very unique, you know, especially unique opportunity here is to talk about, you know how that that lack of support from the Muslim community and the imp, the imp experience of your father going through that for your family, like how that felt like. What like what was that like for you? You know how did that shape? You know also just your your life beyond that. You know um, beyond beyond that, just beyond the whole imprisonment of your father, but also the fact that the Muslim community didn't support you or didn't feel. I don't know if, if you felt like they supported you guys enough. Um, there were definitely certain segments and individuals within the community who um, had the courage to show their support um, at a time when 
uh, the majority certainly did not. And again, I'm thinking of people like Al Saeed who really stood by us um, at a time when so many people really didn't want to associate with us. And I mean, some of my older siblings have stories of people who literally see them and just like run in the other direction from them because of how terrified they were just being seen with them. Um, as, as far as, you know, the community learning from this experience i mean it upsets me that not only are they not learning from this particular experience but they're not even learning from the experiences of other minority groups in fact the minority groups that i see that um you know muslims regularly want to learn from are um some you know uh groups that actually end up in their in the course of their political lobbying uh, pushing particular interests that actually fall within the scope of American empire. And those are the people that they're trying to regularly emulate. I think that there's a severe um, desperation on the part of Muslim Americans. And of course, I'm talking about immigrants and their descendants in this country um, to basically be accepted within the fold of whiteness. And so that's why, despite the um, clear predatory policies and um you know uh, actions that the fbi has taken towards our community you still see a regular attempt by muslim leaders and institutions in this country to actually work with the fbi and with the police in this country whereas for example you look at the black community and they know that the police and the fbi are not there to help them they know that they're not their friends they know that they're not patrolling their neighborhoods because they care about their safety and yet after the Christchurch shooting, you had several Muslim leaders and institutions who were regularly inviting the police to come to their mosques, despite, you know, countless stories of, you know, uh, regular surveillance of our spaces, despite countless stories of even specific targeting of individuals within our community, which is not only disrespectful, I think, to black Muslims in this country who don't get to enjoy the same privileges that someone like I would, but I think it's incredibly you know, disingenuous to even honoring our own history and the history of other minority groups in this country. And as soon as Muslims in this country, I think, particularly of immigrant background, can accept the fact that they will not be accepted into the fold of whiteness and into kind of American imperial policies, the sooner we can actually start taking a real look at, you know, who the enemies are in terms of these institutions that are actually out to get us. And we can stop cooperating. I mean, like we're talking about Muslim betrayal of like, or the community betrayal of like my family and how we felt like alone and stigmatized and so and so on. But it's one thing to like not want to associate with with us because you know you're really terrified that like the FBI is going to get on your back. But you can only imagine the betrayal that someone can feel, someone like me in my position or anyone else, <clears throat> because there are hundreds of families who who are uh, in a similar situation to mine, and unlike us, you know their loved ones are still behind bars today. So you can only imagine what they must feel like when they actually see community members and leaders and institutions embracing the FBI and welcoming um, the police into their mosques and into their spaces. Um, that for me is a much more serious betrayal that needs to be talked about. Um, or the fact that literally the names of Muslim political prisoners who are still in prison today are not even spoken about. I mean, how many of us can actually say that we even know the names of these people, the people who are still sitting behind bars, the people who are sitting behind bars because you know, they're pushing interests that are vital to our community, whether it's even just supporting charities and working in charities that are sending money to needy people abroad. Um, we don't even know these people's names. We don't even know the situations they're in. We don't even know what their families are going through or anything like that. So, so, so some, uh, some, sorry, some of the code defendants that your dad uh, was part of, uh, he they're still in prison, right? They're, I think I remember reading that uh, many or a few of them got life sentences is that correct? I think uh, Judge Leon... No, my, my dad's case in particular was one in which um, we pretty much uh, won that case, actually. Um, you might be thinking of the Holy Land Foundation okay. <clears throat> in Dallas, uh, you know, a few of whom are serving life sentences. Right. <clears throat> uh, well, he, well, he wasn't co-opted with the... He wasn't kind of grouped together with the Holy Land Foundation group or that because his name was Those often tied to that organization... So how did how did Holy Land get associated with his name? Or is it, is Several it... people are associated with the Holy Land because what um, the government did was basically release some document, which is obviously incredibly unethical, and they don't normally do this, of quote unquote unindicted co-conspirators. So they're basically saying that you're a co-conspirator without actually indicting you. And of course, 
without if you don't indict someone that means you don't actually have any evidence or, or any substantial amount of evidence to even you know claim that you were involved in some sort of co-conspiracy and there are so many institutions and organizations i think even like um care i think isna might even be listed as an unindicted co-conspirator on that document i mean so many institutions and individuals that they kind of just released out there just so that um you know, and almost like canary mission style, just to kind of like have you blacklisted, just so that if um, the FBI or government agencies or even anyone else, other institutions, want to kind of like be terrified about associating with you, they just say, "Oh, they're an unindicted co-conspirator." No one even has to really know what that word means. Wow. Can, can I? Can I add something? So you mentioned something earlier about um, you, you, the thing you mentioned totally about Muslims working with the FBI and the NYPD, etc., stuff like that, where these these people spy on our commu- spy on our communities. You know. Uh, you know, uh, got rid of our leadership, imprisoned our leadership. Um, you know, li- literally like left uh, that that in a way that has left our community like basically like kind of castrated <clears throat> as a result. Um, you know, one thing I've seen or I've started to see that has resulted from that is this in- insistence or impl- like implication or like this some subtle belief that maybe even if the U.S. government is corrupt in their judicial process, that maybe they had some element of truth to the cases against these people. And I think the thing about your dad's case was how ridiculous some of the uh, evidence that was used against him. I think one thing that's very ironic is that he campaigned against secret evidence, and secret evidence was used against him in his trial, right, with the phone calls. They tapped his phone, and they didn't show him the phone calls they're supposedly using as evidence against him, right? Can it, you can't you can't testify you can't fight against that really um and, uh, and he mentioned uh, i remember he mentioned some one case before where one piece of evidence evidence they used was that if somebody he knew or somebody who knew him had a dream about him espousing quote unquote like jihadi or terrorist ideology and they used that dream as evidence against him in court like this is ridiculous like, it's nonsensical what these people get away with in court um, and, you know, one thing that, you know, I really admired, you know, especially about your mom as well was, you know, in terms of in the, in the documentary was how she was very explicit about these people are like, like Shaitan can learn from them, right? Because like, they were just so mischievous and how they used evidence. And everything. So, you know, how, how, can you, can you like give us like more information about, you know, the fallaciousness of the evidence that was used against your father at the trial? Yeah, of course. Um... You know, I, I can give you one example. For instance, um, they would have all these um, websites that are basically websites of, um, you know, specific kinds of groups and so on that, that have, um, you know, practiced violence in the past abroad. These are websites that he didn't even access. Like he would access a website that has that links to that website and he would never actually have access to that website. But just the fact that a website links to another website, they were trying to basically try to use circumstantial evidence to um, try to link him to these groups. Um, and there are just countless, countless examples of this. I mean, just books he owned. They would just say, oh, he owns this book. I mean, they were literally, I mean, at one point, this is a story that my father actually loves to tell. They were listing all the, him and his co-defendants' names you know, Samuel Arian, he has a PhD, you know, so-and-so has a PhD, so-and-so has a PhD. And then like another person that they, um, you know, had accused of being a co-conspirator who had two PhDs and they were like, he has two PhDs. And they were literally basically trying to use the fact that these are intellectual people against themselves by, by basically trying to appeal to a jury of ordinary Americans and say, you know, these are elitists here and intellectuals who um, are not like you and therefore you know you have to look at them differently basically Uh, so there was this real attempt on the government's part to um, just even read things in a scary voice like like I think my mother at one point kind of mocked this in the documentary as well where the way they kind of like read the transcripts of phone calls that were tapped I mean my house phone was tapped since 1995 so they had basically half a million conversations at their disposal to just do whatever they wanted with and at one point you know, someone was on the phone saying, you know, come on over, we're having kataif tonight. Kataif, of course, which are like little pancake dishes um, that you eat during Ramadan. But whoever they had translating, translated kataif as kataib, come on over, we're having brigades tonight, or like we're holding brigades. <laughs> so this is literally like the level that we were dealing with. Um, at one point, they didn't actually use this in the trial, but the government actually um, showed this in one of the pretrial hearings, I think. Uh, they bought an entire bus. Fifty thousand um, dollars, 
um, had like a banner of We Love America on it and just blew it up on camera just to show what a bus bombing looks like. Um, you know, that's why there are people who basically suspect that there was $80 million uh, spent on, on this entire trial, on this case. Um, but you don't even have to look just to my father's case to see the absurdities of the government. I mean, you could look at the Holy Land Foundation's case. I mean, that was a case in which the government literally admitted that every penny that they sent to Palestine actually went to feed needy children, uh, orphans, uh, widows, and so on. But their argument was, and they said this with a completely straight face, that by sending money to needy people, um, Hamas in Palestine yeah. didn't have to use their money to support those people, and therefore yeah. they could use their money for weapons. So literally, like, they basically made it illegal to support um, needy people in Palestine, and they it, ended up yeah. getting 65 years in prison because of that. It, it was something ridiculous, like... Um, because they they gave money that created like you know s systems or institutions that help poor people there it made hamas more popular and helped them win their election as well or something it was something absolutely nonsensical you know um, now who were the prime movers in in pushing these like archaic methods of persecution who do you, who do you feel like was it just an administration uh, or do you think this was something power of the part of the power structure that it it found um, it needed to make an example of your people like your father? Yeah, several people are involved, are involved in these things. Um, I would highly recommend reading Miko Pellet's book about uh, the Holy Land Foundation case, in which he even finds links between um, you know the ADL pushing for persecution of. Um, the Holy Land Foundation. So this definitely has, you know, several of its roots, even in non-governmental -gov institutions. Uh, in my father's case, we know that um, the university was definitely involved. The university, which was at the time led by a president who has um, investments in Israeli settlements. So she's ideologically and even financially tied um, to the Zionist project. And um, the university was trying to fire him as a tenured professor. And the case was so uh, controversial that even the American Association of University Professors threatened to blacklist USF if they fired a tenured professor because they were taking it very seriously and they were monitoring it very seriously. And my father was actually winning it uh, in court because it was actually, uh, it reached the level of being a court case. And um, the university needed assistance and the government stepped in to help them. I mean, again, the FBI had been tracking my father since 1995 and tapping our phones and following him, all sorts of things. Um, but, uh, you know, they definitely ha had that push from the university, from the governor of Florida at the time was Jeb Bush, from the Bush administration, the, you know, the Ashcroft Justice Department as well. Um, but there are, you know, there are several forces at play. The FBI can be tracking you for a very long time, but they need some help from the Justice Department. The university or, or other organizations like, you know, and even nonprofit organizations can always play a role um, when there's... Uh, something ideological at stake for them as well in terms of the impact that you're able to have in presenting ways of being or ways of supporting Palestinians or ways of empowering Muslim Americans or anything. So I have a question because, you know, obviously your dad tried to go through the within the system route of trying to lobby, etc., to get rid of things like secret evidence. So, my, you know, where this is going. So my question is, what do you do you think that there are better methods or different methods that that we that we as a community have not yet explored that we should go about utilizing, you know, just from your experience and just from, you know, being, you know, you know, from your from knowing your father and, you know, even somebody as strategic minded as him and as has as careful as he was as he is as well. I mean, as intelligent as he is, um, you know, do you feel like there is hope in the concept of working through the system if we know that once you do that and you're good at it and you're a Muslim, they like will go after you. Like, is it a feasible strategy to get rid of these kinds of like unjust policies at this point? Or do you think we should, you know, take up other uh, avenues or <laughs> what have you, you know, whatever? I have um, no idea what you're getting at. I mean, I, I don't know what it means to work out outside of the system. So what I mean, America. okay. So what I mean, what I mean by that. So for example, I'm gonna give you an example. So like sure. um, the civil rights movement, right? It was not necessarily a lobbying type of movement where you had to go lobby politicians per se. A lot of it was grassroots organizing. You know, quote unquote, like civil disobedience, but in a way that was addressing sort some injustices. Um, that was, you know pressuring government that was uh, pressuring government outside of you know just purely electoral politics where oh we just have to vote these people out etc right like do you think that 
you know, at, at least with how uh, Muslims kind of have this holy grail idea of working within the system today, that there are different, you know, more uh, feasible or examples within uh, American history, for example, that we could learn from that can enable us or empower us to challenge these kinds of unjust policies. Um, because that, you know, to be quite frank, electorally, Muslims by themselves are not necessarily a powerful ele ele electoral base because we're not a big voting base, right? So, I mean, the, that is just my question too, because I know, um, you know, you're very uh, politically minded as well to address. Um, I mean, look, the civil rights movement definitely worked within the system as well. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Martin's meetings with, um, you know, Johnson that actually got bills passed. And, and that's what was in Martin's mind. I mean, when he was doing the March on Selma, yes, it was civil disobedience. Yes, it was in the face of literally being murdered. But it was, you know, with the ultimate goal of actually getting done, of getting something within the system accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily separate these things. Mm -hmm. And even my father, I mean, I don't want to give the impression that he was like just some political lobbyist yeah, of course not, just yeah. working, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Congress on a regular basis. They were only meeting with him because he was also leading marches and bringing people together. Um, and, 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 all, and, you know, this is referenced in the documentary as well. So, I mean, um, his base, I mean, his, 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 like he's at his most self when he's doing grassroots work and he's building mm -hmm. coalitions. Yeah. And bringing yeah, people together um so I, I you can never have one without the other because if yeah. you're bringing people together and doing grassroots organizing i mean that has to result in something right you're looking mm -hmm. for some sort of policy change um I, I think about these political prisoners who are you know many of them sitting in some of the worst conditions right now in solitary confinement for the rest of their lives literally for the rest of their lives and they went to prison when they were like 22. um how do you get them into a better situation i mean only through getting politicians to actually you know do something about solitary confinement which is a form of torture or actually um you know trying to get some level of reform and of course um i don't I, I disagree that muslims are not a um a strong voting uh, that, that they can't be a strong no, voting block be. they certainly aren't right now yeah, but that's yeah, yeah. because we don't have you know um legitimate institutions and, and and leaders that are actually um doing anything to bring us together in fact we basically just have corrupt individuals and institutions that are trying to represent Muslims as a voting bloc, but I think many people see right through them, and M-Gage is one organization that comes to mind for me right now, mm -hmm. um, that wants to be the, you know, uh, Muslim representation when it comes to electoral politics and how we vote, but um, they're incredibly corrupt, and they certainly don't speak for Muslims um, on the ground, because I just have never seen that they actually have a relationship with them. But, um, you know, so I would never say that we shouldn't yeah. sacrifice that we should sacrifice um our engagement with the electoral system and with politicians but of course it has to be done in a way that is uncompromising and with a goal in mind i mean that's the yeah. other thing. the people who actually are regularly meeting i mean you're right there it's oftentimes just photo ops yeah. uh, and you even ask like what did you talk about what did you actually bring up to them and you you'd never really get anything substantive um i mean my father literally like had to draft a bill you know getting um condemning secret evidence and, 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 and promising that um, the, the people being held behind bars would actually be released and he presented it to them and he was literally running around getting co-sponsors and so on. I mean, how many people are actually doing that kind of thing today? Well, what would your father be doing if he was here right now uh, in, in the Muslim community in, in the United States right now? Because as I understand, he's living in Turkey right now. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for him, his priority has always been uh, civil rights of Muslims in this country. Well, what are the his ability... thoughts like regarding what he's seeing um, with our various levels of engagement in, you know, all the, it seems like many, many of the Muslim activists are, you know, aligning with other minority groups, whether it's the, the BLM movement, LGBT movement, and so on. Um, do you think that's strategically correct? Um, at least, what would he say in regards to that? Well, I don't want to speak for him. You guys can maybe invite him sometime if you'd like to have a conversation well, with him directly. I can tell you based on just my education under him, but of course it's going to be my own reading and my own um, understanding of how I read things. But, um, I mean, look, alliances are always going to be important um, with, with other movements no matter what. But it always has to be strategic in the sense that there's a goal in mind, that we're actually going towards a specific thing. And it has to, oftentimes it should be in the realms of policy, not just 
I want to change the way that people think about such and such issue or something like that. Like, like there's an actual policy goal that, that, we're, that we're moving towards and we're allying with a specific movement in order to actually get that. Um, and that everything, every march, every event that you hold, every teach-in or town hall meeting or anything that you're doing or every politician that you're engaging is just meant to move forward to that specific goal that you have in mind. And once you hit that goal, you go to the next thing. And I do know that he definitely thinks that our civil rights is the most important thing right now mm. because um, our mosques are being surveilled. We're constantly being wa um, you know, watched and targeted. Our leaders are being persecuted. But you know, I would go a step further and say that there's even a deeper problem where we're, we're self-censoring ourselves. We're monitoring ourselves. I mean, um, you don't have to worry about the FBI targeting an imam who says something in a mosque because the board of that mosque probably won't let him say anything to begin with that's critical of American empire and that actually you know calls out the FBI or government policies or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, the Islamic um, uh, Center of Southern California, which is very close to where I am right now here in LA, which is a mosque that's obviously connected to MPAC. Um, that banned Khalid Abdul Fadl from speaking there because he wanted to just say some words about, you know, Mohammed Morsi's death. Yeah, I heard about uh, that. That was just incredible yeah, to me that we were at this point in, in history that we have to worry about our own community members who might be sympathetic towards uh, in an autocratic, uh, you know, a despot ruler and, and their feelings towards that. Like, are you kidding me? You know, at what point do we actually take a stand on something, you know? But, uh, exactly. It's very fr exactly. frustrating in that respect. So, so I guess my question then, Ali, is what is something we can all do right now at this moment, everybody, for political prisoners like Al Saeed and, um, you know, like Imam, Abu ja uh, Imam Jamil, et cetera. Um, like what is something that we aren't doing that, you know, beyond, you know, having the political goal, et cetera, but like something right from right this moment, right after people get off of this podcast they could go literally do right this moment i know it's a, it's a it's kind of a loaded question but it's this is a question that people always want to know or ask you know it's you know you could you could say there's nothing you have it takes work right and i would agree but like is there anything that for example would have helped your family your dad um who are going through this situation that we could be doing right now for other people in our community yeah especially the the brothers who are still who got convicted for the holy land foundation and they're in life in prison and if, if they were tried right now, they would, you know, I, I'd like to think that the same conditions aren't in place where they would have, hopefully they would have received a fair, fair trial. I mean, I, honestly, I'd be even more terrified if it happened today. Um, I would hope that non-Muslims would, would have been um, more willing to speak out if a case like that were to happen today. Because as Hossam pointed out, it wasn't the Muslims that were speaking out. Um, during my father's trial, it was the non-Muslims that came out to show support and solidarity um, that really helped us pull through. Um, and I think one of the jury members, even from the trial, specifically mentioned how every day when he would walk into the courthouse, he would see these non-Muslims, you know, marching outside and holding signs. And one of the jury members said, you know, this is not his community. These are not just typical Muslims that are marching outside. These are non-Muslims that are that are seeing something that uh, something else they're seeing something that's behind the picture that the government is painting and it definitely had an influence in, in terms of how he approached the case um so one, one of the things i would say Hassam, is um i definitely think it's important that we build relationships with other groups um again obviously it should always be you know towards a specific goal um, and I think when it's towards a specific goal, it allows us to kind of set aside specific ideological disagreements about something or even ethical disagreements about particular issues that, you know, we feel are socially relevant um, because we're moving towards a very specific goal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are red lines, but I think these red lines have to be discussed. And that's one of the other problems is we're not even willing to have these conversations. And the red lines have become so non-existent that we can literally have organizations and individuals now that are openly collaborating with Islamophobic institutions that are openly violating the Palestinian call for BDS, um, which that would have been unthinkable at some point um, earlier in our in, you know, Muslim American history. And now I think the biggest problem is the Muslim American, you know, Muslim American as a political identity has just lost so much of its meaning. It, it, I, I can't even tell someone what it means anymore. You know, there was a time when to be Muslim in this country, especially during the time of people like, you know, Malcolm X and Muhammad Adi, 
it meant to be anti-war. It meant it was a revolutionary force in this country. And right now, I can't even say what it means anymore. Does it mean working for the Trump administration on some ridiculous human rights commission? Does it mean, you know, inviting the police into your mosque? Does it mean uh, suppressing scholars from being able to even talk about injustices abroad? I mean, let alone in this country, what does it actually mean anymore? It's lost any substance. And what people need to do, I mean, I hate to have to start as something so basic, but we need to even just start forcing these conversations and actually trying to determine what are the red lines in our community and what are the issues that are vital to us? How come none of us know anything about the Muslim political prisoners, the hundreds of them that are being held across yeah. the country and we don't know their names or anything? And how come their names are not spoken about in our mosques? How come our Friday khutbahs don't talk about them and don't make da'at for them? And at the very, very least, it's not even like spoken. And um, finally, I think there needs to be a serious conversation about what our political priorities are. And I think that there's no one in agreement about this. And mm -hmm. so when you say we're not a powerful voting bloc, well, we're certainly not if we're not even kind of moving towards specific goals for what we'd like to see done for our community. I think it's extremely important that we obviously talk about, you know, issues that are relevant, that are more relevant, I should say, to other communities in this country, whether it be, you know, the concentration camps on the border or police brutality that specifically, you know, um, targets right. black people. But at the same time, we need to have an identity in, in terms of speaking for our own issues as well. And that when we're expressing solidarity with those communities, we're inviting them to express solidarity back for issues that are vital to us. I mean, the, the, U, the U.S. Embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and I, I didn't even see any form of outrage, honestly, among uh, Muslim Americans. I mean, it was a joke. It happened without us even uttering, you know, anything substantive. Yeah. And, and you know, it's really interesting because you mentioned earlier that your dad was the one who wrote up the secret evidence policy, right? And oftentimes, oftentimes what we do as Muslims is we kind of sideline our issues for others to pick up and maybe they don't really understand the depth of the issues, right? So like, for example, the concept of Islamophobia has kind of been, you know, some capacities people have co-opted it for other means or other, you know, causes or what have you. And it's a lot of times because we kind of deferred, you know, the control over the, those kinds of narratives to other people or the war on terror um, or, or the wars in general, like we kind of have not been able to own that narrative and own the policy discussions and the, you know, be the ones who push the, or who drive, be the driving force of, of these policies to, to end these, you know, injustices. And, and you know, it's actually really, um, um, you know, it's interesting too, that um, we're not focused on political prisoners. Cause you often see some, many Muslims in the U S like if you mentioned Palestine and stuff like that, what they'll do is they'll say, Oh, Islamically, we have an obligation to our local communities before our foreign <clears throat> communities, right? Stop sending money overseas, etc. But then those same people, when you bring up the political prisoners in the U S the, the most Muslim political prisoners who are local in their communities, they will add, and then also try to shut that conversation down. And so like right now, like there's this really, uh, pernicious or like kind of malicious you know narrative to undermine um any political activism or like serious political activism within the muslim community that goes beyond just reinforcing the status quo um and you know one thing i really really admired um about your father in the uh in the documentary was when he mentioned when he did the plea deal or whatever right he he never he never acknowledged their claims that he killed any innocent people or anything like that. What they try to do is they try to criminalize things that he did that were just, that were correct, that were righteous, and say that what he did was illegal. And all he did was he affirmed those things he believed in, those things that he did that they're claiming was unjust because he affirmed that you know Israel is an occupying force and an occupying state, and he supports all legal means to oppose it, etc. Right. And, and that's something like I really admire about your father. And I feel like it's something we can all learn in terms of that courage that even when we're faced with this, with the laws that are against us to try to demonize us and make us scared to speak up, that we still own, like you're saying, that Muslim identity, that those Muslim values that will, will color our beliefs no matter what, no matter who tries to tramp down on it. Um, and, you know, like, I, you know, for me, like, I, yeah, I'm really happy that you're here because it's really important that people start you know, facing the, the, you know, the faces of the people who had to suffer and go through, go through these injustices themselves and, and hear it from them as well. Right. Cause a lot of times people feel distant from it. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know. I just wanted to just throw, throw that in there uh, real quick. Um, um, yeah. Ali, I, I want to know a little bit about 
what you envision. I know you're working on, on a BDS project. Um, as I understand, it's a documentary. Am I correct on that? Yeah, that's right. So um, a lot of people, you know, to be honest, most of my uh, friends who uh, I grew up with, they, you know, they're, they're very um, pro-Palestine and everything, but they know very little about BDS and they're their their participation in BDS is minimal. Um, what I always felt was like uh, BDS is a is a wonderful movement, and I I really think like there needs to be uh, a new marketing campaign for it because I just think I remember when we were young we would get like this flyer of like a hundred Israeli companies not to buy it from, and that was the BDS movement to me. Is that what it still is? Is there more of an organized effort in how we're going to identify some of the the, the the companies that are the biggest violators to make our make our voice heard much more uh, poignantly, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, <clears throat> look, as far as BDS goes, um, I mean, I'll start from those lists that you talk about, and especially because every time there's another massacre in Gaza, um, those lists are passed around that has literally everything from like Coca-Cola to McDonald's to just every corporation in the world and that just says boycott all of these because they're all Zionist organizations. And I mean, it's, sim it's simply not true. Um, those are not official BDS lists. I don't know who puts them together. The, you know, the BNC, which is the Boycott National Committee. I don't think they know who puts that together either. Um, but the the BDS movement does have its own website called, which is bdsmovement.net. I believe they're still working on revamping the website, so I look forward to when it's you know a lot more um, organized. But as far as how BDS actually functions, I mean BDS doesn't simply function on a collective boycott of just all of us, uh, a consumer boycott basically. It doesn't only function that way. It is important, and. Um, it's important not in the sense that we have to target the biggest companies because actually, um, you know, the BDS movement, this is going to be spoken about in the documentary. Um, they're actually very strategically minded in terms of how they call for specific boycotts of, of you know, particular companies. And some of them are too big to boycott, like Intel, for instance. Intel fits so many other conditions for when a boycott is called. They uh, are deeply connected to the occupation of Palestine. Um, and they're deeply connected to um, several other unjust issues around the world, not just tied to Palestinians. So there is even an ability to kind of build alliances with other groups there. Um, the difference is they're just they're, they're too massive. It's, it's very difficult for a successful consumer boycott of Intel. But there are um, other companies that um, they've called for the boycott of. I mean, Sabra Hamos is one. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I walk into Arab-owned convenience stores that offer Sabra Hamos and it, it just infuriates me. I mean, not only is it disgusting hummus already, which is an insult, <laughs> but on top of that, it's deeply connected to the oppression of Palestinians. And it's mm -hmm. something that I feel like at this point is just, should be so well known um, that it's pretty outrageous. But, you know, I don't go in there shouting at these people when I see it. I just try to have like a meaningful conversation and just try to kindly tell them like, you really should consider removing this product from your, uh, from your stores. Um, I've known several groups, including like, you know, JVP, which I think does a lot more BDS work, unfortunately, than Muslims do. Um, that's Jewish Voice for Peace, for those who don't know, who, you know, go and they talk to supermarkets and they also try to get them to, to kind of like remove Sobra from their shelves. Um, that can work because, you know, if we get enough people and enough consumers to actually boycott a company like that, then it's actually making a stand. And, there, and there's uh, a real chance for success for something like that. But BDS works in several other ways. I mean, you hear about divestment campaigns all the time that are taking place on different college campuses and even in cities. Um, and these are incredibly important movements because divestment is really one of the strong suits of BDS and it's where they've had a lot of success already. They've and, gotten, it, and it's proven to terrify them because of what we've seen in Texas. As you know, uh, Texas is uh, has a law that prevents state or uh, state employees from participating in any kind of BDS. Is that correct? Dozen, dozens of U.S. states do. Right, right, several. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, and, mean, and I said Texas because there was recently a case with a teacher or something. Yeah, yeah. The, the teacher was a big one. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a year and a half ago, 
Um, there was obviously uh, in, uh, what was it, Dickinson, Texas, the suburb of Houston, where the city made it a condition after the hurricane hit, they made it a condition that um, you have to pledge that you don't support BDS in order to receive <laughs> government aid, or like, yeah, government aid. Um, for like repairs on uh, the damage done to your home. I mean, it's it's literally gotten to that level of like just insanity. Um, Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, please, please. So no, I was just thinking about some ideas and I want to run that past you as uh, various different ways that our community can actually, uh, at least within ourselves, we can work to increase some awareness within, um, uh, you know, major metropolitan areas that have a lot of, uh, various Arab and Indian grocers that are, you know, they're Muslim owned, and you can, we could probably go through their uh, store and help them identify any products that are Israel Israeli owned, or you know, sometimes some of these owners just aren't very um, cognizant of the, of the issue. And if you make them aware, I I, I think. You know, maybe we could uh, at least within our own community, you know, just clean that out, and so that um, we we make a dent in some respect uh, related to our own purchases of Israeli products. What do you think about that? Absolutely, I think um, that would be incredibly important to kind of go and meet with them. I mean, um, the two products in particular that I would strongly recommend focusing on again, Sabra Hamos is definitely one. But the other one is uh, dates. I mean, there are, there are you know thousands of Muslims uh, around the country that every Ramadan are breaking their fast on Israeli dates. Wow! Uh, that's and like eating, uh, that, that's you know, there like have been several people. I think Dr. Hatem Bezian is one person in particular. I think American Muslims for Palestine also published, you know, um, like a clear kind of like flyer pointing out like these are the dates like to avoid. It's very straightforward. Um, and we just need to make sure that people are really aware of this, um, so they don't continue to do that. So, so um, you know, one thing that is also linked to this, uh, uh, I guess, the Muslim community lacking goals, etc. I would say is goes hand in hand with the Muslim communities. Uh, what was it called? Like this, they're starting to dismiss the Palestinian issue more and more, which is also why they're not. We don't have many Muslims leading the charge on BDS and stuff like that. Definitely, there's that fatigue. Other organizations. It's, I don't. I don't think it's just fatigue. I think it, it ties into like everything: the war on terror, the the political prisoners, all of that. Where this this uh, this culture of fear uh, and censorship that has occurred has resulted in the Muslim community taking a backseat on all these issues, right? So, yeah. I, I guess um, you know. How, I think on a grassroots level, what do you think like Muslims should be doing more and more, um, especially Muslim, I say youth, because I think BDS is much more easier to disseminate and work with the youth on. Um, what, what can we start doing once we work with the youth to really start, you know, like charging the Muslim community to take the lead on these issues once again? Yeah, get them energized. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, there are a number of things. One thing that I'll, I'll start with the probably the least popular suggestion, which is um, I think there are several forces within our community that are not just, um, you know, you know, politically fatigued when it comes to the issue of Palestine or willing to kind of like sidestep the issue for political expediency, but are actually actively working to undermine this movement and the cause within our community. There are, you know, several, over, like one important facet of, of the BDS movement is the concept of normalization and not normalizing. And, you know, we have several, um, you know, prominent members of our community who go on, um, you know, funded trips to Israel. MLI is one in particular, right. uh, a program that does that, but there are others, uh, in direct violation of BDS. And literally every single one of the arguments that these people have presented for why they go on this trip has been dismantled. You can study Zionism in the U.S. You don't have to go on a trip to Israel if you want to learn about Zionism and learn the kind of uh, the Zionist narrative. I took a class at my university about it. I mean, it's really it's not like it's something that is just so incredibly difficult to access. Um, But on top of that, I mean, we have several 
imams of, of mosques in, in, in different communities that are regularly working with the uh, American Jewish Committee. You have MJAC, which is tied both to ISNA and the American Jewish Committee. I mean, the American Jewish Committee is an incredibly Islamophobic organization. Again, yeah. Dr. Hatem Bazian has written a lot about this. Um, you have the ADL that not only worked um, to, to kind of stir up the case against the Holy Land Foundation, but they're also getting, you know, police officers sent to Israel for training. I mean, people have heard that police officers get sent to Israel for training, but the ADL is regularly working on that. They're yeah, actually, yeah. and now they're starting to send uh, judges and prosecutors to Israel for training. Why? I mean, who the hell really knows why they need to go to Israel for training, but they are. We, uh, they sent TSA to, agents there. We also have Rashida Taleb who accepted money from J Street. Now she ended up in her defense returning that money after uh, who's that guy from Electronic Intifada? He called her out Adi on Twitter. Obama. Yeah, Ali Obinima. He uh, he ends up calling her out on Twitter, and she I guess claims to have returned the money. But I mean, Rashida Tlaib, to be fair, has actually come out in full support of BDS, um, mm. and yeah. J Street basically disowned her because of that. Yeah. Mm. Um, and and she's taken a lot more courageous steps on this issue than many of the people I'm referencing. I mean, so some of the most random imams of, of of just small communities who are working with the AJC. Or, or the ADL, um, or, or several of these other organizations that, um, in direct violation of BDS. I mean, some of these programs like MLR are specifically described by the organizations and institutions that are setting them up to be um, deliberately, uh, you know, created to undermine the BDS movement. And yet, this is still something that exists. And people who go on these trips, and people who regularly work with the ADL and the AJC, and all the oh, and the ADL is also involved in several CVE initiatives. Charles. Yeah, they also went to the UAE conference and got awarded over there. By right. Muslim scholars, <laughs> oh, right? By Muslim scholars who shall yeah. remain nameless, and but that's the point. Is like you have all these forces within our community that are directly working with these forces, um, and I just don't understand how these people within our community are literally not treated like someone like Zohdi Jasset, like lit like on that level where you've basically betrayed every principle of which this community should stand for, and I don't know how. And like we can, you know, stand with you in good conscience because you're working with institutions that are literally sending police officers to Israel for training, and then they're coming back and killing people. Here. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I like dividing like those imams you talk about into two categories. Where there's, I feel like at least I believe, um, I don't know if you agree that there's one category of imams who are just ignorant; they don't know much about any of this stuff, and they're just kind of going with the flow. And there's another group of people. Who are actively doing it for their self gain, right? Like I was categorized those people as like Rabia Chowdhury, um, Wajahad Ali, Harun Mogo, you know, the typical names, etc. Um, but then there's also like some imams who, after you speak to them and explain to them what's wrong with what they're doing, they'll stop doing it, right? So my question actually is that that goes into that topic that the thing you mentioned about those people who are actively trying to undermine the Palestinian issue as like a career you know, boosting opportunity. Um, you know, I feel like something the Muslim community lacks is a clear database that they could refer back to of which individuals we should avoid associating with. Which, like, I had some comedians, like some some people, not comedians, sorry. I had some people and a comedian, a uh, non-Muslim one, who've approached me and they're like, hey, can you give me a list of organizations and individuals to not go on uh, work with or go on panels with or, or whatever so I don't violate BDS and I never have like a, a list immediately sometimes you have to do research extensive research like can you find you, that list you on think, BDS that BDS website I, I don't know but there isn't like a list of let's say American organization I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure to my knowledge yeah, there isn't I don't think there's a blacklist that exists yeah there's no blacklist um, that exists but like isn't that kind of needed at the moment for like us to be able to identify not necessarily quote unquote blacklist don't call it that but just identifying <laughs> these organizations you know just to avoid whatever legal problems you want to say or whatever right just like legal like organizations who do work with Israel or Zionist organizations or entities and individuals who've worked with those people with those um, and and you know, disseminating that to the Muslim community. To MSA Perhaps if someone wants to work on that um, list, they can. I mean, it, I think it would require a lot. Um, yeah. It's more work than I'm willing to put in. And <laughs> I, I think, the, it, you know, like the top because, because violators, would, you know, so this, this, we just need like a handful just to make a difference. We just, I mean, that, but that's what I was going to say yeah. is actually, um, I mean, number one, the, the amount of compromised leaders and in institutions is, 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 is staggering. I mean, it's, it's more than someone can even imagine when they see how, like how every organization and institution and, and so many of our leaders are just compromised on different levels. Um, but that's the other thing is, you know, how would you even determine what these red lines are? I mean, I think before yeah. we even get to the point of these lists, yeah, like there has lines. to be a conversation within the community of 
you know, what are these positions, these principal positions that we cannot tolerate people kind of like going outside of? Um, I, I mean, at one point, like if you asked me like a couple months ago, I would have said, oh, supporting Trump, you know, anyone who supports Trump, like that's pretty obvious, but apparently working for the administration <laughs> isn't even enough. So I, I frankly don't even know what it is anymore. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, what would even earn someone a spot on that list? And then like, how do we even know that the most, that the Muslim American community at large would respond to such a list? Because do they even agree with what these limits are? And that's the problems. I don't know what the limits of engagement are. I don't know what the limits anymore are. And it's because I don't think we're even having an honest conversation. I think we've kind of reserve, you know, resigned to just being sheeps that are kind of led by these people who, you know, I, I, I don't see a proper vision. I don't see a clear vision in terms of, um, where they're trying to lead us as a community. So I feel like that responsibility falls on people like me, you, others, um, to start just putting enough content information out there that we override their narrative, right? Yeah. Like, so for example, like, um, like with MSAs, like having content out there about why we're working with Halal is not proper and stuff like that. Like, like, like actually like addressing these things on a root level through online, you know, articles, etc., like producing things online. But and also, obviously, the grassroots work is the most important aspect of that. But one thing I think that one issue that we're facing right now is that many people they claim I don't agree with them, but they claim that a lot of the Palestine rhetoric and movement rhetoric is mostly secularized or leftist or liberal or what have you, and it's not really a Muslim cause any longer. Sorry about the background. Um, and so basically, um, what time is that? You we need to, no, it's not my mom. It's my <laughs> somebody just walked in the house. So uh, basically, I think that we need to start, um, I guess, pushing back against this narrative and, and making people realize okay, well, the big reason why these secular movements, these leftists or whatever, quote unquote, are controlling the discourse is because Muslims have taken like a back seat. But I feel like we need to do more in terms of producing and i think your documentary is a good start for example a good example of the things we kind of need to start doing to push and drive these points home into the muslim community where they become clear red lines to them because i feel like that's what people respond to nowadays like i don't know i feel like principle the argument about principles doesn't really work for people anymore it's like just what the narrative dominant narrative is right and what's pushed the most um in my experience but i don't know what, what your thoughts on that are I, I don't know who these people. I've never engaged with someone who says that the. I mean, that's why I don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. That says that um, you know the discourse surrounding Palestine is too secularized now for us to engage with. Um, I don't like. I don't know what political issue they would point to that is not secularized in terms of the discourse surrounding it that is spoken about in like the proper Islamic context. I don't know what that issue is. Mm -hmm. I mean. The Muslim ban is not spoken about by citing the Quran or, or, or hadiths or anything like that. It's spoken about within the framework of, yes. you know, American law and how it's specifically targeting a specific group of people uh, based on their belief system and so on. Does that mean we shouldn't say anything because it's too secularized? Like, I, I, I don't even know what that argument yeah. is. And frankly, it just sounds like such a cop out it is, um, yeah. for people who just don't want to engage with the issue of Palestine. And, and so they kind of just throw these things out there. Um, I, I, so my point of saying that is there are a lot of these counter arguments um, on which I don't think it's our responsibility to deconstruct mm -hmm. them because they're, they, don't, they don't make any sense to begin with. Um, and a lot of the people who insist on working with Hillel on university campuses or the ADL outside of university campuses or anything like that, um, okay, admittedly, you know, you don't necessarily want to condemn everyone outright. But I know from experience that a lot of these people are made very well aware of yeah. the problems with this issue and, and, and ignore it. The majority of my experience in talking to people privately about this has literally been this, that they're made aware of these concerns. Oftentimes, other people have expressed, them, expressed it to them before, and they deliberately disregard it. And, um, you know, they do it. They, and what's problematic, actually, is that they talk about how secularized, you know, supposed discourse around freedom for Palestinians and decolonizing the land is. Interfaith is super secular. <laughs> Inter I mean, not only is it super secular, but they have this really bizarre way of like trying to Islamize, like normalize, like working with Zionist organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Where they literally try to like cite examples from like the prophetic tradition and so on about working with other um, groups of faith, where they're basically like then trying to act as though it's a religious conflict and you solve it through you know, just being nice to each other and they remove the political context completely. 
Um, and that is the most secular way of approaching the issue that I've ever seen. Um, so, I mean, frankly, it, it, it just doesn't make much sense. And I think that I agree, there has to be the counter narrative, mm -hmm. but I don't think that our counter narrative needs to spend too much time, time deconstructing the other narrative. I think it needs to be basically, um, and that's why I think it's important to bring back the discussion of our principles and our principles yeah. is actually mm -hmm. what gives us a political identity, one that I think that we've lost. You, you know, you, you're, I, I think you're right because, you know, when I dealt with an issue about like this with the MSA recently, um, one thing that, that I was, the reason why I said that is because I was told, you know, a lot of these kids are young. They don't have much political knowledge, know-how. Some of them don't know anything about Palestine. Like, it seems like the younger Muslims get, uh, the next, the, the you know, the next generations are learning less and less about Palestine and its core, how it's a core issue for Muslims and how Al-Aqsa you know, especially because of Al-Aqsa, also predominantly because of the oppression, right? That's the most important thing is the oppression of the people there. So um, one thing that, that that came up was, oh, you know, I was told to stay away from SJP and people who affiliate with SJP and these Palestine movements because they they go from a liberal secular framework and they get these messages from mentors, from mentors, right? Like people who are older than them who they look up to. And that's kind of why I wanted to point out that. But the other thing that you mentioned that you mentioned from the get-go is this political identity i really think like that's probably like the key core issue here because the thing that um i was told was like oh you know um with msa like when i'm participating in msa's i didn't sign up for all this political stuff right and it's like now we need to start pushing this understanding that there's no such thing as being apolitical as a muslim as being part of an msa there's no such thing as apolitical being apolitical within the academic sphere right like when you're in the when you're in the academic sphere, when you're in college, wherever you are, these Zionists they see this as a battlefield. These Islamophobes see this this area, this area of uh, you know this part of society is also a battlefield. This is like a war for them, and we also need to treat it that way. We need to start tackle. We need to start identifying, our understanding ourselves within these kinds of you know political battles, and not you know you know distancing you know, or d d dividing Islam from the political, because really a lot of it, our existence really depends on the political right now and how we engage with the political, right? Um, I, I really do think like, you're right. I think one thing we all need to start doing is like creating these plat platforms or pan like these, uh, yeah, platforms within our local communities where we gather the leadership, we gather the youth and we start discussing these issues like and establishing what the red lines within our community is right my only fear is that when we start discussing these red lines people do not have a grasp of what good red lines would look like and they would the red lines would end up be community consensus on things that are not good or beneficial like i feel like if we had a discussion about red lines today maybe palestine would not become a red line um so like what would you say like for me like i'm like i'm worried that's my worry is that I feel like the community is not ready to even have a discussion about red lines because they don't have a understanding of proper principles or assessment of principles <clears throat> and how it relates to the political today. It's like, how do we tackle that issue? I mean, I think you're right when you say that there are a lot of Muslims who try to uh, divorce the politics. And I mean, for me, it's like, forget even, um, you know, citing the tradition for a second. Forget even like what we can find in our own tradition you can't exist as a Muslim in this country without your identity being taken for granted as a political one. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a black person, like, you know, just walking down the street and saying like, I just don't want to be black today. I just want to be seen as like a white person. It's like, that doesn't work. Like your identity is something that's already being observed by other people. And it's treated and Muslim today is treated as a political one, whether you like it or not. Now, if you're too terrified or you just don't want the headache and you just want to become some doctor and have a house in the suburb and just kind of live your life, um, that's one thing. But sooner or later, there's a strong chance, especially with the direction this country is headed in, where you're going to actually have to learn the fact that Muslim is a political identity. Maybe it's going to be a hate crime or maybe the police are going to treat you in a particular way or maybe you're just going to have an experience at the airport. S someone's going to have that kind of experience where they learn that you can't run away from it. You can't just divorce your identity from the context in which you live. Now, if you just don't want to deal with the politics, if you just want to kind of try to live your own life and let other people deal with it, that's one thing. But then step aside and let those people who actually want to, you know, have a say in terms of our political future, 
you know, uh, play their role. Don't undermine that. Don't actually try to, you know, come back with some counter narrative about how we all as a community should divorce ourselves from politics. That's not the solution. When literally the president has said, I'm at, we're at war with Islam. I mean, that's not how it works. Um, so frankly, yeah, these people, I think, you know, if, if they don't want to be involved in politics, they should kind of like move aside and let, you know, other people steer the conversation. Now, as far as what you said about you don't think we're ready to have a conversation about red lines. I mean, it's a very fair point. Um, you know, you, you mentioned something earlier about how our own narratives are being rewritten by other people, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the war on terror or anything like that. And it's true. I mean, look at who we're regularly promoting now. We're regularly, like, as a community, we're regularly promoting a guy whose only claim to fame is being the father of a soldier who participated in the occupation and legal war of Iraq. So, yeah. so, I mean, it's not only that like we're allowing other people to rewrite our narrative. Wow. It's, it's, it's that we're allowing crimes that took place within our own lifetime to be reevaluated in a particular way. I mean, how is a young Muslim growing up today supposed to even reconcile one of the worst crimes of the century, which is the invasion and occupation of Iraq, with the fact that we are praising a person whose only claim to fame literally has done nothing else except being the father of a person who participated in that invasion. And, 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 and I don't think that the Muslim institutions and the leaders who are promoting this individual have even thought about that. What does it mean for a child to be growing up and have to reconcile these two things? Uh, Ali, for them, I can, Ali, I can tell you this much. That from the few years that we've been doing this podcast, that's not even in the frame of a lot of these organizations. Many of these organizations are thinking, who do I get on to still stay relevant? How do I, how do we st um, attract a younger crowd and how do we get Mehdi Hassan to show up and Hassan Minaj to show up and, and all these other, you know, identifiable people to come on. And it's like these type of, um, they're not even doing this type of thinking that you're talking about. And it's so unbelievably frustrating from my perspective when I see this, this trajectory we're on where we just kind of fed into this, this uh, um, bite size culture of, of you know, uh, entertainment and and uh, start you know trying to attract people to your your crowd so that uh, you still stay relevant. Mm -hmm. I, I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. um, you know the guys invite like the guys legitimized by the DNC and Hillary's campaign, and all of a sudden we adopt them wholesale and kind of just bring them on board. And of course, there are several other people. Um, like that. We don't even have to focus necessarily on him. But yeah, I, I don't think that um, you're right. I mean, Muslim institutions are more uh, invested in their own survival than in um, actually playing a, a, a significant role in determining the political future and the political identity of a new generation of Muslims, uh, many of whom are now growing up as Muslim Americans in the Trump era. I mean, what was the Clinton era for us uh, is now the Trump era for several young Muslim Americans who this is the only reality that they know. And um, I, it, it terrifies me to think what kind of um, future we're creating for these um, for this next generation in terms of our um, political approach, our integrity as, as Muslims and as activists in this country. Um, and the fact that, you know, many people are more interested in defending um, compromise individuals and institutions against what you know they think is the worst thing in the world, which is call out culture, as if that's the worst thing in the world, rather than what's actually being done. You know, um, it's it's crazy when you think about it. Like you have eighteen year olds today who grew up after nine eleven, or actually they're going to be in a month, but they grew up after nine eleven happened, um, right? And like I was somebody when nine eleven happened, I I saw the shift, even though there was always like some prejudice, but you see that you. I was eight years old when it happened. But I saw the shift immediately the day after and how teachers treat me, et cetera. And it's crazy that you have Muslim Americans now who are growing. They don't understand that the status quo right now is a result of all this war on terror, like mind games. And like, they, don't, they didn't see that shift. This is what they grew up with. And that our Muslim leaders are going along with it. Like, it's crazy when you look at old ta older talks from scholars from like even like 20, 2003 to 2005, et cetera. You hear them talk about America. And they'll talk about America as the sick country. Like, it's a sick country that needs to be, it needs Islam or something like that to fix it, right? Whereas today, you don't have people talk like that. You don't have Muslims talk like that. Oh, what they talk about is, oh, we need to, uh, this country's values. And we need to, you know, Find get people ground. on board. 
yeah, find common ground or this isn't America's values. That's not the case that that before. That's not how it's called. That's not how our imams talked about the U.S. at all. You know, for the most part, you look at a lot of the prominent imams you know, like 10 years ago, I would say before Orlando and maybe before like 2012, etc. Um, but especially before Orlando, where they would talk about the U.S. as like, you know, this, this country has a lot of issues and it's not something that islamically we can be sit down and accept and work with and in, in regards to or integrate into we have to change it right yeah. and i feel like a lot of the change in their political identity for muslims comes from these leaders who kind of just stopped caring or they just you know it's more ca- career-wise their, their more narratives feasible. changed from in uh to address an existential threat that they felt like um you know if if they don't adapt to this climate that you know muslims will disappear like I yeah. think there's going to be a wholesale slaughter on, on a genocidal level i, I mean the over it, w- it was such an overreaction after 9 11 that i mean maybe maybe hindsight's 2020 and maybe you know i'm not in a position of leadership and i can't talk about how uh the, some of those imams felt at, at that time but but that time has passed, and it's time. I think we need to reevaluate things and and say like, okay, wait, wh- where are we headed here? Because uh, post nine eleven era has gone, and came and gone, and now we're we're in a situation where we're, we're just that we have really nothing. We're intellectually bankrupt. We we have nothing to offer the world. Where we're really I, I'm not, yeah. I don't even just, think it's like intellectually bankrupt. Like it's like. Like for example, like I went to this uh, uh, pre Ramadan iftar with the NYPD. I went to say my piece to them. Um, I went for work or whatever, right? And you know, I talked. I mentioned, you know, how are you going to ask for the community to trust you guys? They gave us. They gave two. Uh, it was supposed to be a two-hour thing. They took an hour and a half doing presentations about terrorism and how they're dealing with, you know, potential rise in ISIS attacks that could happen after New Zealand and yada yada yada. Um, and then they gave us five minutes and they called, to, to ask questions and they considered that like a conversation, right? So I asked, you know, how do you expect us to trust you guys when you have a history of spying on us and putting informants in our communities? The other questions after that were, oh, can you call what the white supremacists did in New Zealand a terrorist attack? Or, oh, how many, how many Arabs are there in the police force? Like to gloat to their community that there's so many Arabs in the police force. Like there's just such a disconnect with what is needed like the policy changes that we need you know the the fact that we need to challenge these institutions so i guess my question ali is um you mentioned how these institutions um you know they don't have a direction do you think it's worth it to try to work with these institutions and kind of change them redirect them or to just forget them and push them aside and start our own institutions that start taking care of these issues and dealing with these narratives on our own terms um do you think it's worth it to you know, maintain these institutions with the direction that they're going. I just want to quickly respond to what you guys were talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I agree with you that I, I think we're headed into an even more terrifying time right now, where, for instance, now that the FBI is finally coming out and saying, like, actually, we do have a white supremacist terrorist problem. Um, I get worried that a lot of not just, you know, leftists and liberals, but even Muslims are going to now come out and legitimize Definitely. these FBI counterterrorism and counterintelligence guys because they're willing to talk about white supremacy now when they're the same people who a lot of their logic of what they're basing this on is my years of experience doing counterterrorism work in the Muslim community tells me that this is how we should approach, you know, countering white supremacist terrorism or whatever. So for me, it's, um, it, it's incredibly frightening that we're now legitimizing these people um, all out of some desperate attempt to feel, I don't know, like vindicated that, people we're for years <laughs> saying like not even that we're not terrorists because that's not even what they're that's saying what they're, they're saying, just yeah. saying there are other terrorists yeah. um so I, I mean that definitely also uh worries me deeply as far as like where we're headed moving forward but as far as you know existing institute i mean look it depends i think there are some institutions that are um beyond working with and and the reason for that is that people have consistently um, called on them to change their practices and they just haven't cared to do so. I mean, mm-hmm. MPAC is one in particular that comes to mind that has been engaging in CBE work for so long. Um, and yet, you know, the, uh, well after it, it's become like controversial and kind of discussed within the Muslim community. And for the most part, I feel like that's one thing that 
we've kind of agreed like yeah that's a bit too much for us um but they still continued and they really just don't care um so i i think there are several organizations that are definitely like well beyond um kind of uh working with but there are, there are others of course that you can work with having said that i'm always for new institutions i always think that we need new institutions i always think that we need to kind of rethink the way we even structurally put these things together because yeah. i mean as um you know imran pointed out existing institutions is primary goal no matter what is just maintaining their existence that's what they're around for they're around to remain around they're around to just stick around longer um and anything that threatens their own existence is something that they're going to um kind of like put the brakes on new institutions and new people who come up with new institutions are regularly trying to go against the grain and they're going to try new things and they're willing to try new methods and not just do the same thing over and over again i think that's incredibly important um but you know more important than you know, do we need new institutions or do we work with existing ones? It's just like work towards what? Like, what are we? Yeah. What are we actually trying to work towards? Um, as you said, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about the future, about moving forward. Um, I think we've lost uh, a tremendous amount of um, connectedness to the issue of Palestine and to Palestinians themselves. Um, and I think this is just, you know. Um, brainwashing basically succeeding um even within our community i think that's what it means to live with a colonized mind and to kind of um you know uh, I, I remember uh, I once hearing hamza yusuf even saying that um you know the palestinians sold their homes to the to the zionists and like later like that typical like kind of zionist trope and several muslim scholars have, have, have kind of repeated that um so there's definitely this perception within our own community to kind of um dismiss a lot of these issues uh, so it's, it's deeply worrying for sure as far as what this identity is going to be and whether you work with existing institutions or new ones, where you're headed and, and kind of what our priorities are. Um, I mean, there are people who kind of talk about the existence of um, gay people in the LGBTQ community in this country as the kind of, you know, the, the one thing that's going to um, destroy us as a community um, as if they haven't been around for so long already. And as if it's like, it's, oh, don't think it's the FBI surveilling our mosques. Don't think it's our leaders preventing us from talking about Palestine and political prisoners in our mosque. Don't think it's the infiltration, the imprisonment, the solitary confinement, and the bombings abroad. It's the LGBT community that's basically going to destroy us as a community. And it's just like, where are our priorities? Like, where are our priorities when, like, we literally have FBI agents strolling into our neighborhoods, taking people up, locking them up, and we're freaking out about a pride parade? For me, it's just, it's just insane when we're this is literally life or death for many people so it's interesting you mentioned that because i feel like the lgbt issues actually amplified because of fbi infiltration etc where we're becoming so much more afraid to just speak up on our principles and on our values that because of the fbi intervention and because of like these initiatives like the rand corporation has laid out with cve etc where if you have these opinions as a muslim then you're a radical you're this or you're that right so like if you actually do want to address the LGBT stuff, for example, you have to address the FBI uh, surveillance. You have to address CVE. You have to address all these things because if you don't, you're gonna probably deem like an extremist if you espouse those most those views that a typical Muslim or, tr or traditionally Muslims have on these issues, right? Um, because that's what they're there to do to criminalize Islam and Muslim beliefs and to distance us from from uh, from these issues. Um, and you know, I just think it's like so upsetting because um yeah like sorry i lost my train of thought because yeah. sound in the background well um uh, ali as as we wrap things up um this evening what uh what what, what do you want uh listeners to take away from this if we if we put elected ali al Aryan to be our leader tomorrow in north america what would you implement for the Muslims. Thankfully, I'd never run, but thanks for giving me the fantasy. Um, <laughs> I guess an immediate purging of, of several individuals. No, but in all seriousness. Um, That's a serious inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, no, but really, I mean, I think there are several things that people can do. I mean, beyond just BDS, like you can go and ask your khatib to talk about, you know, um, Look up your, in your community. I'm sure many people in, 
you know, across the United States have individuals in their communities that was targeted by the FBI and are sitting in prison right now. Ask your khatib to talk about them. Their families literally might be in that masjid on, you know, this upcoming Friday. Why are we not talking about them? What can we do? Can we bring their family in and talk about how we can support them? You know, many prisoners, families don't have any money. And, uh, you know, I know from experience that being a prisoner in prison, from my father's experience, of course, uh, without money, without money even to buy canteen food is miserable because if you don't buy food, you can't fast, for instance, um, unless you're willing to eat the leftover food after the, which they give you later on. I mean, there's just so many other um, ways that we can help these prisoners that is incredibly letters of support. Important. But yeah. yeah, letters of support and, and just awareness within our community so they're not forgotten. I mean, I think the worst thing in the world is for them to be forgotten, is for, is for them to be locked up in these places, which is what the government wants and for us to just literally forget them. Because when you forget them, we forget what they went to prison for and, you know, who they are and therefore what we are and what we are as a community represent. Um, so for me, the first thing would be awareness, educate yourselves. Um, if you have questions about, you know, partnering with Zionist organizations or Islamophobic organizations, there have been countless articles written about that. I mean, I just don't think it's an excuse anymore that I didn't know. It's just we're way past I didn't know. At this point, enough people have said things, enough people have written, provided evidence, um, including non-Muslim groups who have done incredible work documenting, you know, police trainings abroad in Israel and so on. Um, so at this point, uh, you know, we're, we're in the realm of action and action has to be done within our community first. We can't be, you know, going around preaching about Palestine when the sheikh of my mosque is doing work with the ADL or the AJC. We can't go around, you know, preaching about um, justice brutality. for immigrants or police brutality when we're inviting the police into our mosques and, you know, welcoming the FBI with open hands. Like, th this is just not, it shouldn't be tolerable anymore. Um, and we need to take a stand. And for those who aren't willing to speak out on it or, or pressure their, you know, masjid board or anything like that, um, at least feel it in your heart. At least, like, when someone stands up in your masjid and says something because they've had enough, you know, give them just even like a nod, like, give them some measure of support. Shake so they don't feel after, like they're alone. Yeah, yeah. Shake their hands right. afterwards. You know, it's it's tough going up there and and seeing something that you you believe in. Especially, it's it's something that uh, that's principle that you know all Muslims would agree to. And and um, you know that that person who who takes that one step, he, they they need people behind them, or else they feel kind of disillusioned and uh, feel a general sense of apathy in, in their community. So, uh, you know, lift them up. If you can't say it, lift up other people who, who do say it and, and, and help them out in whatever you can. Um, can, can, yeah, can I just ask one last question? Sure. So, um, the question I have is, are there any organizations right now that come to mind that do help political prisoners and Muslim prisoners that are not as recognized that we should be sending our money to helping in any way, volunteering, etc. Absolutely. Now. I mean, uh, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, uh, CCF, civilfreedoms.org, they do incredible work. Um, they do um, uh, a charity drive every year around Ramadan where they try to send $100 um, to each political prisoner. They have incredible, you know, database of Muslim political prisoners across the country, hundreds and hundreds of, of them held in, you know, terrible conditions. Uh, they're in touch with every single one. They get letters from these prisoners every year after Ramadan, like just thanking them so much for how much that like just a hundred dollars meant to them. Um, and this is something that we should be doing several times a year, not even just for Ramadan. For they Ramadan. do a conference um, every year in October for the families of political prisoners where they bring them together and they kind of um, connect them and, and, they, and they give each other support because unfortunately many of these families aren't getting support from <laughs> their local communities. So at least they can get support from each other. Um, but I'll definitely look, you know, uh, recommend people look into that organization and try to support them, donate to them, do anything. I mean, they have such an incredibly low budget and they're doing so much um, as opposed to, you know, Muslim Instagrammers that are making, you know, insane amounts of money. And, and yet you have these institutions of ours that are literally running on like, you know, just pennies. Yeah. Man, um, Ali, thank you so much for coming on this, e uh, this evening. And uh, for real, having me. real quick, uh, can you tell us when to expect your documentary to be out? Yeah. Uh, we're working to finish it by the end of this year, inshallah, by the cool. end of 2019. And how do people get a hold of you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never yeah, mind. Uh, they can try to live my life without. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's just. Well, uh, you, you can. 
Contact you, you, me. Con- contact uh, Hussam. I'll, I'll contact you. Hussam, man. Hussam will be the filter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be the filter. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming through, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, bro.